Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 15 of the Plumecast. I can't believe I'm already on my 15th episode since I started doing this, my weekly gaming news podcast where I talk about stuff that I've either talked about throughout the week or stuff that I haven't been able to get to. And it has been a lot more eventful week this week than, let's say, the last three or so weeks. So there's a bunch of stuff to go over this week. Thank you all for stopping by. If it's your first time here, make sure to go check out the channel. I am doing daily news videos, mainly on Xbox news. And then this is my weekly podcast where I just cover pretty much anything I want to cover. A lot of Xbox stuff, some PlayStation stuff, and just anything going on in the video game industry. So every single week on the podcast as well, if you haven't been here before, I drink a beer. I am a big beer lover. I love trying all different types of stuff. And this week I am drinking a Pilsner called the Berlin here it is the berliner pilsner and i don't believe i've ever had this before so i'm sure i'll like it i like pilsners they i like the taste that they give so i'm sure i'll enjoy it but let me know in the comments below what you guys are drinking give me some suggestions i always keep an eye out for the stuff that you guys comment for beer and uh yeah so in terms of what I've been playing this week, it's been I've been playing two games mainly. So if you guys watched the episode last week, I got invited to be a part of the Ubisoft Canada Guild, which for me, very exciting uh, because I love tons of Ubisoft games. Like I can't, I think about a lot of the games that they put out and I play most of them. I'm hoping one day that they put out another Splinter Cell. That's one that I'm really waiting for because that was one of my favorite franchises until they stopped putting it out, obviously. But like Assassin's Creed, the Watch Dogs series, the Scott Pilgrim vs. the World beat him up. That's one that's like, not a lot of people think of, but Ubisoft publishes that. Uh, they have the Rainbow Six stuff that I play a ton of. So I am just a big fan of a lot of their games. And they sent me over a code for Watch Dog Legion. So, uh, and the season pass for it. So I jumped into that a bit this week. I in terms of Watch Dogs, I played the very first one when it came out on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And then it was okay. Like, I enjoyed the first one. I thought it was a good game. I thought it was a good concept. But they just didn't, like, do enough with it. They didn't expand on it enough. And it was kind of repetitive. And then Watch Dogs 2 came out. And I skipped out on that for a very long time until it became free on the Epic Game Store. And I finally jumped in and played it on PC and absolutely loved Watch Dogs 2. I thought it was a great sequel. I thought it was just a great game. And, and I thought it was just much better than the first one. And then Watch Dogs Legion, I haven't gotten around to playing it. But thanks to Ubisoft, they've provided me a code to check it out. And um, yeah, I've played about an hour of it. I don't have a full opinion or anything of that yet. It'd be irresponsible of me to give my opinion on what I think about it yet. But it seems like more of Watch Dogs 2 in London and there's like a new system where you can like recruit anybody onto your team and everything. So I'm sure I'm going to enjoy it a lot. And besides that, for some reason I was going through my catalog and I started playing the first Assassin's Creed game again. And I was just going through my Xbox. It was in my library. It was downloaded. It was ready to go. And I launched it and I've been playing it all week. And it brings back so much memory, so much nostalgia. I remember getting the special edition Assassin's Creed was in like a tin box and I think I still have it and it came with like a little um, Altair figure and it was just so awesome when that game first came out there was so it was such a good concept it was so different with the way that you were like parkouring climbing up walls how they built the environment something that we hadn't really seen before in a game just how beautiful the environments were how lifelike how almost one-to-one -one they were for an xbox 360 game of course and it was the first game launching just one of my favorite video game series of all time which is assassin's creed so it had its flaws. It wasn't the best game. It wasn't like a game that got the best reviews either. I think it got like a like average like seven out of ten or something. So it was a it was a average game in terms of reviews. But even playing through it again right now, I think it's still a very fun game. Yeah, it has like I said the flaws, like the combat. I mean, all the stuff got vastly improved in Assassin's Creed Two and Beyond. But has like the combat where one, only one guy attacks you at once and it's slow, and the actual missions are very repetitive but it's still in my opinion 
for nostalgia it's great for me but in my opinion as an overall game for when it came out in 2007 i think it's still an incredible piece of work with what they did with just like the environments and jerusalem and and that area of the world and everything it's so cool so i'm playing through that again because i just i don't know i just felt like jumping in that's the great thing about having a huge catalog of games on your console ready to go anytime you can pretty much just jump in and play whatever you want so let me know in the comments below what you guys are playing this week and overall on this week's episode there's a bunch of stuff to go over i'm not going to usually give you the lowdown before we start but there's a bunch of stuff so i'm just going to jump in all of the timestamps and will be in the description so you can either jump to what you want to listen to or you can listen to the entire podcast that's going to be up to you but Without further ado, let's jump right into the topics. All right, so kicking things off here with the biggest announcement by far this week, and it was the announcement that Valve is releasing a new handheld gaming device called the Steam Deck. Now, it went on sale on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was really... It was crazy what happens obviously the store when any of these big things go on sale crash right away which is what happened with me you had to go and buy it through your steam account and you would log in or whatever you would select the one that you want it would take you over to the payment option and then it would just keep freezing and not working and it happened to me and i thought that there was no way i was going to be able to get one of these but randomly at like 3 p.m. like two hours after it went out for sale I still had it in my cart and I went through to see if it worked and it worked so I was lucky enough to be able to get in on the reservations for this device and I could not be more excited so if you haven't heard yet the Steam Deck is like I said Valve's portable PC in your hands pretty much gaming device and it's very powerful for a handheld gaming device they're saying the best way to measure it i guess you could say is that it's about half as powerful as the xbox series s but it is more powerful than the playstation 4 and the xbox one and i know that may not blow some people away but that's not the point here because it is a great powerful handheld gaming device but it has so many features that is going to make this thing i think absolutely awesome so it's going to support ray tracing vrs and a programmer is comparing it to the xbox series x in performance per pixel what is awesome is that it is powered by amd's rdna2 architecture and it does have hardware support for direct x12 so you're going to be able to get the variable rate shading you're going to be able to get the ray tracing it's going to support the amd fidelity fx features one of the most important ones i think what stuff like this is going to be the super resolution where you're going to be able to keep games at a good resolution with steady frame rates so that is extremely exciting to me because we're going to be able to play games at that look great and have steady frame rates right in the palm of your hands now on top of that it does come with steam os so if you see it here you're gonna have steam os you're gonna get access to all of your steam games and everything that's available on that operating system but valve made a video specifically saying that this is just like a pc in your hands you can pretty much do whatever you want on it you can install windows if you are to install windows which is what i think i am going to do once i get this you can put xbox game pass on it an xbox game pass for pc or xbox game pass ultimate and this literally could be just an xbox handheld where you're downloading games onto whichever version you got i got the nvme 256 gigabyte model so right onto the nvme storage and i'm gonna be able to play anything that's available on xbox game pass on the go on this handheld natively without having to stream it with xcloud and that is what has me excited is that it really is a pc in your hands you can plug peripherals get the dog plug peripherals in you can plug in a mouse and keyboard put it on a monitor and i don't know i just find when these types of devices get put out and you're not locked to an operating system like you are with the Nintendo Switch. It just makes it that much more interesting. It's the same thing when it comes to cell phones. i much rather use an Android phone because you can just do so much more. You're not locked to the Apple operating system and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I don't know. It's just, I'm a very excited for this. I think it's going to be a game changer in the handheld market. And I think personally that it's going to be... I mean, it's, it's not going to outsell the Nintendo Switch, but I think it may push Nintendo forward in what they're doing. Because if you look at the Nintendo Switch, you look at the recently announced Nintendo Switch OLED edition. It's, I don't want to say pathetic. Well, you know what I will. It is pathetic, The what they're doing with the Nintendo Switch OLED. 
in the fact that they are charging $50 more for that. And it's come out that, I mean, it is business, but it's come out that it's only costing them like 10 extra dollars to manufacture or something like that. And you're, they're putting it out there. It's a refresh. People are going to eat it up. It has the seven inch screen. It has the OLED screen and the OLED screens look great. But I mean, the original PlayStation Vita had an OLED screen and that's way, way older. That screen looked great and it just completely failed. But there's absolutely no upgrade into the internals uh, as to what is running the Nintendo Switch. It's the same power. And I think that it is kind of lagging behind in terms of where we are right now in gaming. It would have been great if they actually did release a Nintendo Switch Pro. But, I mean, that may come out in the future. But there are so many people saying that there was a Nintendo Switch Pro coming. And it never came out. And I feel like a lot of people got bad information or just reported on the the wrong thing or maybe the information they got is still going to come to fruition but it won't be for a while and then you look at something like this the steam deck which is only 50 dollars more if you get if you get the lowest model now the lowest model doesn't have nvme storage it has emmc but it's still far superior even with that storage on there and it's only 50 dollars more than the nintendo switch oled edition and i think that like if you if you were choosing between the, we'll go in American dollars, the three ninety nine or four hundred dollar Steam Deck or the Nintendo Switch OLED with the three hundred and fifty dollar price tag, I wouldn't. It wouldn't even be a thought for me. I would one hundred percent go with the Steam Deck. Now, I guess the kicker or the trump card that Nintendo has is their first party exclusives and. I mean, I'm a huge Zelda fan, and I agree on that. I'm wearing a Nintendo shirt here with all the Super Mario stuff. I love Super Mario. I love the Nintendo exclusives, yes. And I would agree that they are amazing games, and that's what you're not going to get on the Steam Deck. But in reality, you could get it if you wanted to. I'm not promoting piracy. I'm not promoting any of that stuff, but it's a PC in your hands. We know that people have already been able to emulate Switch games on PC. We know that... The Nintendo Switch has already been hacked and that people can go ahead and download Nintendo Switch games for free. So you would technically be able to play Nintendo Switch games on here if you want to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not a fan of piracy. I don't think it's a good thing because if you're somebody, especially if you can afford to pay for video games and the stuff that you want to enjoy, I feel like if you are getting all of this joy and entertainment out of a product, out of a game, you should be more than happy to support the people that are creating the game for you. And that's why I'm just not a fan of piracy. I don't pirate games. I haven't pirated games since I was probably like 15 years old or something. Like I just don't deal with that. I have no problem spending my money to support developers who make the stuff that I enjoy. So, but I am saying there are going to be people out there that are going to be playing Nintendo switch games on this thing. I can guarantee it, which is just crazy to think about, but yeah, I'm so excited for this thing. I'm so happy that I was, able to get one i mean if the reservation didn't go through luckily like two hours later for me i still would have picked one up later it doesn't mean that i'm going to get it on day one because who knows how long it's going to take them to actually ship these out to everybody they say they're shipping in december you have christmas you have all of the holidays that stuff isn't going to be shipping out probably so a lot of people may not get these until 2022 we don't know but when I pick my up, when I get mine, I will be definitely making videos on it, showing you how everything works. And then hopefully I can figure out how to get windows on it and, and get game pass on that. And then show you and give you some reasoning. If you're looking for it as a Xbox handheld machine, whether it's worth it or not, I think it will be, it's going to run all of those games. Great. Now staying on the topic of a potential Xbox handheld, Phil Spencer, as he usually does when something awesome is announced from another company, he reached out on Twitter and said this, this looks really great. Congrats to the team at valve software and getting so many of us excited to be able to take our games with us wherever we decide to play. Now he's not saying anything there. He's not insinuating that Xbox could potentially in the future, make a handheld because they're so impressed by this thing but what i do think that the steam deck is showing with the craze around it after the announcement with how fast it went with the reservations and just the overall hype for this thing is that there is still that huge market for people that want triple a handheld gaming i mean the nintendo switch was the first one to really 
show that that market is not going away anytime soon. It is such a popular market. In fact, it could be more popular than the at-home console market. But this is definitely showing that if, I think in my opinion, if Xbox were to create a Xbox branded specific handheld like this, where it's your Game Pass device, it's your Xbox device where you can download all of your digital content that you have purchased, it would sell very well. And I think it would be a, a great move by them. Now, the thing with the Steam Deck is that it was first out there. So th it's going to take a huge chunk of the market because people who would maybe potentially on PC see the Xbox handheld and go for that right away may not want to do that anymore because of the Steam Deck. So they may have they may have missed the boat on a, an Xbox handheld. Will they eventually release one in the future? Probably not because their goal is xCloud and streaming on cell phones and not creating this expensive piece of hardware that they have to push people push on people in order for them to access Xbox and in their hands because with xCloud and everybody has a cell phone, they can already do that. So I don't think there will be an Xbox handheld, I really don't, but hopefully I'm proven wrong because personally, I just like seeing cool tech like this stuff come out, whether it's really successful or not. I just love seeing it and and I always want to pick it up. But besides actually making a, a dedicated Xbox handheld, what may happen in the future is more is Xbox is going to work more with Valve and getting more games onto Steam so that those First party Xbox games can all be accessed through Steam and people on the Steam Deck are going to be able to play them. I think we will see even more of those first party Xbox games coming right away to Steam. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense. You look at the Steam charts with like Sea of Thieves and Forza Horizon and Halo Master Chief Collection. It's been on top of the Steam charts multiple times. People on PC are paying for these games that are coming out from Xbox. And then what there was this rumors that all started back with the Apple versus Epic case that maybe there was something going on between the two companies because Phil Spencer was having meetings with Gabe Newell and who knows what those meetings were about. But I think those meetings are all about just getting more Xbox games into Steam more so than anything else. So it's great to see this gaming industry and everything just opening up more where we're getting a device like this the yes, it's from Valve. Yes, it has SteamOS, but they're allowing you to put anything you want on that. And I think a lot of people are going to do what I'm planning on doing, and they're going to transform this into an Xbox handheld. With Windows 11 coming out, it could be the perfect time because Xbox Game Pass is going to be built into that operating system, which will make it just run better. I saw problems sometimes with my Xbox Game Pass app on my PC on Windows 10, so... I'm really hoping with Windows 11, all that stuff goes away. And I think just overall, this is an exciting device. Whether you care or not for handheld gaming, whether you care or not for Steam or PC or Valve or anything like that, overall in the gaming industry, in the handheld market, I think it blows away the Nintendo Switch by a mile and overall just a very exciting device. But let me know what you guys think about the Steam Deck in the comments below. All right, now moving on here to June 2021 NPD results. So this has to do with sales of consoles, the Xbox Series XS, the PlayStation 5, and the Nintendo Switch. And the headline here is that the Xbox Series X and S consoles led in dollar sales in June and the Nintendo Switch sold the most units. Now, before we get into this, I've said this many times and even with these results, I still 100% believe that the actual unit sales of a console in this generation between the Xbox and the PlayStation 5 absolutely mean nothing to Xbox as their goal is to get people into their ecosystem no matter where they play. They don't care if you're playing it on a Series X or S. They don't care if you're playing it on xCloud on your phone. They don't care if you're playing it on PC. They just want you within those that ecosystem. And the general or I guess the old age console wars of units sold and comparing it to me and I think to well I definitely 100% think for Xbox it doesn't matter but let's take a look at this because it is interesting to see the numbers so for the month of June 2021 this comes from Matt Piscatella on his Twitter thread he says that he revealed that the top selling consoles and games including so that's, sorry, he revealed that the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Series S consoles were the best sellers for the month 
in dollar sales, setting a new record for Xbox sales in June, and that the Nintendo Switch retained its streak as the best-selling console in units sold. And then in terms of games, the number one selling game in June was Ratchet and Clank, A Rift Apart. Not surprising. The Ratchet and Clank part, I mean, that was it's a great selling game. It's a great game. Um, I don't, I've talked about, I played through it. I beat it. I think I beat like 97% of it. And it took me, I think it took me like maybe like 16 hours or 15 hours or something. It didn't take me very long to beat 97% of the total game. That means like collecting everything and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I'm a huge Ratchet and Clank fan. It's one of my favorite franchises of all time, but I still waited for it to go on secondhand. I got it for like $30 less because I don't think that even though it looks great, even though it is definitely a high quality game, it's worth the $90 before tax uh, here in Canada, but it's still a great game and it makes sense why it was on top of the list. Now, what is surprising though is Xbox is setting records in terms of dollar sales. I I shouldn't say surprising, but it's just showing you the narrative that you need huge exclusives at launch in order to sell consoles. So you need huge exclusives in general all the time coming out in order to sell consoles. That argument is completely being blown away. It's being blown out of the water and the people on the Sony side who can continuously use that argument are being proven wrong when we see things like this because Xbox hasn't had a first party exclusive come out since the launch of the Xbox series X and S and it is doing extremely well. And then the other narrative that is completely being destroyed here is that the fact that Xbox has an ecosystem where you can play their games on PC right now, you can play their games through streaming it, that that was going to kill the Xbox console, which from the very beginning, I said that that was a bogus argument and that that wasn't going to be the case. The reason why Xbox is doing so well right now in terms of their dollar sales and in terms of their consoles that are can't even come close to meeting the demand right now is because of what they have done and how they've turned the ship around from the Xbox One in terms of being consumer friendly, having backwards compatibility upgrading backwards compatibility games and then the big kicker xbox game pass and what they've done with that i think that e3 i think this these numbers here are very good at showing how much they knocked the xbox and bethesda showcase at e3 out of the park like they destroyed it because from what i was reading in last week's episode that the the game pass subscriber numbers were kind of leveling out a bit pre three. They weren't going up as fast. And after three, it started to explode again. And when they did that show and they showed all those amazing games and the 27 of 30 of the 27 of the, the 30 games now are coming day one on Xbox game pass. You can believe that the amount of people that were, were craving getting their hands on an Xbox and wanting to get into the Xbox ecosystem is went up astronomically and then on top of that you think of the entry into xbox right you can literally get an xbox series s for 300 dollars, and then you get game pass and you can play all these next generation games not everybody wants to play games on the most powerful console 4k all that kind of stuff a lot of people just want to get a device that they can easily set up onto their monitor and be able to access the ecosystem that's what the xbox series s is great for so these numbers are not surprising but they are great at just destroying all of these stupid narratives about you have to have exclusives to sell consoles right away. You have to, you can't allow your games on other platforms or no one's going to buy the, you, that plot, that specific platform and that exclusives is the only way to sell a console. And, and I think Xbox, this generation is kind of changing the industry and what they're doing with their ecosystem and showing how successful it is and going forward, we're going to see more companies doing this. You can believe we are going to see PlayStation do this. We are going to see more PlayStation exclusives come on to PC. It's a matter of time, whether it's this generation or not, it is going to happen. And that PlayStation ecosystem is going to open up soon. I'm, I, my prediction on previous episodes was that I think that PlayStation kind of missed the boat this generation already when it comes to creating like a ecosystem game pass competitor i think it's too late and they're going to be completely fine this generation with locking people into playstation 5 and putting their console exclusives 
only on the console, but you can believe that they are all sitting in a room right now preparing every single day for the PlayStation 6 or whatever is beyond PlayStation 5 in order to to have an ecosystem like Xboxes. In fact, in, that that was my initial prediction, but it may even be coming sooner than we think based off of some leaks that came out with in regards to with we know that Netflix is entering into gaming, but in regards to some PlayStation information within the file. So I'll just pull that up here. So there was a leak that came out saying that PlayStation and Netflix may happen for an Xbox game past rival. And this is a, a leak that came out. And what the leak was was that Netflix's gaming feature has a current working name of Shark. So that's that's I guess what they're gonna think about calling it. And is represented by this image in their iOS app. It's a shark fin. And on top of that, an image of PS5 controllers and Sony's Ghost of Tsushima director's cut coming August 20th was showed up in these files in the back end. And people are saying that this could indicate a partnership with Sony. Now, I don't know. Maybe this was just something because Ghost of Tsushima comes out August 20th. But I guess maybe they may launch it when the Netflix thing drops because Netflix says that they are going to be putting out their their service, their gaming service in 2021, right? By the end of the year. So maybe maybe PlayStation is going to try to get into the streaming or to the the uh, the subscription model and move away from what they already have with PlayStation now and do something with Netflix. Or maybe they'll just partner with Netflix and put their games on that service so they can make the money off of that. Who knows? I could see it happening. I mean, maybe they're going to do this while they try to really flesh out their entire ecosystem. Or maybe they don't even want to in-house build their own massive ecosystem like Xbox is doing and they want to just do a bunch of different partnerships where playstation exclusives that were previously locked to consoles are going to be coming out on other platforms we've seen it on pc but maybe on other streaming services and maybe netflix is one of those companies that they're partnering up with i wouldn't be surprised if that happened as well so this is just the beginning and like i said these npd numbers are great for just destroying all of these old age thoughts about exclusivity and how it's the only way to sell consoles and you can't put your games on anything else or nobody is going to buy that device. It's great that this stuff is kind of getting rid of those, those narratives. All right, now moving on here to talk about a game that I think a lot of people are waiting or have been waiting a long time to get some sort of update on. And that game is Remedies and Smilegate Entertainment's Crossfire X that is an Xbox exclusive when it comes out. Now we finally got a big developer update from Boo who is the executive producer of Crossfire X and there was a bunch of stuff that they get over graphics, game modes, as well as some video tours of the map. So starting here with the graphical improvements, they say here, as great as the maps looked in the beta, we wanted to increase the immersion of our players. To do this, we have improved graphical quality of our existing maps. So they, they give us some pictures here. And if you click on the pictures, you'll get a better look of what is like the before and after picture. So if you're watching this podcast on YouTube right now, here is a quick look. Here's the before picture of the map. And if I just go back here... And then here is the after picture. And like, in my opinion, there is a pretty distinct difference in what they've done with the textures, the details, the lighting, the reflections, just in this one screenshot. And, and that's just one of the maps. And then if we go, oh, I'm on a different article here. Well, talking about the same thing. But then if we go here to another one, this is just another map. Put up the second one there. And again, like I think I think the biggest thing that they've done here with the upgrade to these these maps and the graphics is the lighting and the reflections. So maybe there's a lot of ray tracing going on here. And you can really see that based off of the, the way that the light is shining off the floor, the reflections on the floor, the way that the light is shining off the statues, the little details like the escalator, you can see like the little lines going through the steps. That's super cool as well. So there is definitely a a graphical upgrade going on here and uh, i'll have the link to the to this article or this development update in the description below if you want to go through every single picture it, you'll definitely see the difference and that's exciting for somebody who's played the beta i thought the game looked okay i mean it's definitely not like a crazy next generation looking game but we've seen games come out from remedy that look 
absolutely incredible. And if, with having that development studio working on this game, I'm thinking that the graphics are going to be a decent showcase on the Series X. And then after they give us a look at those graphical upgrades, they talk about some maps. So they talk about three maps that are coming to the game. And they're, they're called Babylon, Invasion, and Babylon Lab. And they're all for different purposes. So Babylon, the, the Babylon map, there's there's also video tours of all of these maps. And the Babylon map is for the big 30-player mode where two teams battle over five different control points. And each point capture opens up supply crates with special items to help your team in battle. Then there is Invasion. And this is for the Spectre mode, which is a close quarter mode. I guess it's probably just like a more of an arena style. I'm not 100% sure. If you've played the Spectrum mode, let me know. Or Invasion. Oh, no. If you've played the Spectrum mode, let me know. And then Babylon Lab, which is for the new Infection mode. And this is a 16-player mode where players must survive as long as they can against infected players. Inf infected modes are always fun. Like the Halo Infected mode. That was always a fun time. I think it was called Infected or whatever. But any types of those modes are fun when you're trying to get away from the opposing team or the opposing players who have some sort of like zombie or disease or whatever. And then they give us the, uh, the map tour here. And they say, they do say at the bottom that it is a work in progress and graphics and features are subject to change. So it may get better or it may be dumbed down. We'll have to wait and see, but it is, it is, they're optimizing this for the Xbox series X. So I'm thinking it's going to look like this or better. And then finally, the big thing here with this this development update is they talk about a big feature or an in-game mechanic that is growing, and that is the tactical growth system. So in Crossfire X modes, players will be able to choose player upgrades that last throughout the round only. So if you're on offense, you can do things like choose to increase your damage. If you're on defense, you can choose to equip a tactical shield. And if you are wanting to increase your recovery, you can choose to have better health generation. So what they've done here is they've strengthened this tactical growth perk and they've added a third phase to this where players can transform into a legendary mercenary, including one that they are calling here Boogeyman. And they show a picture of Boogeyman and I gotta admit, this is awesome just artwork. Like I put this up on a poster. It looks very, very cool. And will be cool to see what this looks like when it's actually in game. Now, the big question people have with Crossfire X is when is this game coming out? When is the actual release date? Because this is supposed to be coming out in 2021. And from this development update, it really improves my hopes that it is not going to get delayed until 2022 because they do hear say at the end that once again we would like to thank you for your patience as we work towards crossfire x's release in the new future this year we are preparing many other things so play, please stay tuned and look forward to them so it should be coming out in 2021 i'm looking forward to playing this game my guess would be that this is going to come out in the fall like september October, November area, which I don't know how to think about that. I, th I think that they should release this game as soon as possible because once fall hits, you're going to have Halo, you're going to have Battlefield, you're going to have the new Call of Duty. You're not going to have Rainbow Six Extraction anymore because that got pushed to January 2022, but you're still going to have such massive shooters all coming out that this game may fall to the wayside for a lot of people. So maybe they do a surprise announcement and they say this game is coming out in August or something. I th think that that would be the smart way to go, or at least in like September, because I don't think you want this game releasing alongside some of the other big shooters coming out in the holiday season or just some of the other big games. Because this is a game where you need to have a strong base right away when it comes out for the lobbies, for the community, for it to continue to grow. Now it is going to be free to play. And the great thing about this version too is that there is that single player mode that they that I think a lot of people are excited for. That, I guess for Crossfire X, I want to play the multiplayer, but I am definitely looking forward to that single player mode. And just to see what the what it's all about because I think that will be a lot of fun. And that could maybe differentiate it from the people that are... That, aren't into just the the multiplayer shooters like people maybe who just want to play the halo campaign and then maybe jump into this campaign after but 
it's gonna it's gonna be tough to compete with all of those shooters coming out so hopefully the release date is sooner rather than later from the looks of it based off of this they are getting close to release and uh yeah i'm excited about it i'm gonna jump in either way it, if it comes out that this near the same time as halo it'll just be one of those games that after i've put in hours of playing halo and i need a little quick change for a little bit i'll jump over to crossfire but let me know if you guys are excited for this game all right so jumping over here to the next topic and this has to do with microsoft flight simulator which is set to release on the xbox series x and s this month and it's a game i think a ton of people are excited for it is probably the best looking game that we've ever seen in terms of just like how lifelike everything is and and when you're flying through different locations it's literally like it looks absolutely incredible but what is exciting about this is that this is a game that people are playing on high power pcs like 2500 3000 dollar pcs in order to get the most out of this game and the xbox series x and s are 300 and 500 us dollar consoles respectively and they are going to be consoles that are going to be able to give similar performance if not the same performance for this game because of the azure architecture now this is there's a bunch of stuff microsoft talked about when talking about flight simulator and i'll I'll just read here the quote. It says, with Microsoft Flight Simulator architecture, the future comes quickly in the form of ongoing extensions of the product and platform. Chief among these will be accessibility by a broader range of devices. Although the initial product release requires powerful PCs, the Azure architecture will enable the Microsoft Flight Simulator experience on other devices too, notably Xbox consoles and ultimately mobile devices. This device democratization means that the product does not require more power on the device to scale rather it just needs streaming bandwidth every device will punch above its weight what you see right now that people are impressed by on three thousand dollar pcs well guess what it comes pretty much unchanged to a five hundred dollar console and we are putting things in place to bring it to you with even lower spec devices like phones so i don't know about you but after reading that it's pretty exciting what the azure architecture is going to be able to do with the fact that eventually on your phone you're going to be able to get experiences that people get on very expensive pcs and i'm excited to see how this actually runs on the xbox series x and if it is very similar to the pc version i know there will be lots of comparison videos between the series x and high power pcs versions of the game and whether this is just kind of lip service or if that Azure architecture is so good that it really, if you have a good internet connection, you can you can get the Series X to do things that internally the hardware won't be able to do. But because of this technology, you're going to get games that, that look better than would be possible on the console. And going forward, you got to think about things like the Xbox Game Pass app, if they're going to be able to get this app on the xbox well it is on the xbox one but if you're going to be able to download this game on like an xbox one and then use azure architecture if you have a good internet connection to give you the experience of like you were playing it on the xbox series x and eventually on your phone how crazy that will be how much that will open up the ecosystem and bring excitement to people that can't afford the, the new console can't afford a high power pc but still want to experience these next generation games that's what has me excited about this thing because it really is going to be able to allow more people to experience games allow more people to experience new next generation games the the overall architecture of this thing is interesting because I believe this was like the similar stuff they were trying to like kind of push with Crackdown 3 and the multiplayer and the destruction and all that kind of stuff. And that obviously didn't pan out. Crackdown 3 by, to the majority of people, to I would say critics, I actually enjoyed the single player campaign. I put a ton of time into it and I thought it was just just fun like yeah it wasn't the best game in the world but it was just a ton of fun but to the majority of critics it was a big failure so it kind of was a shot at this technology here now correct me if i'm wrong if they were kind of touting the same thing with crackdown 3 may maybe it wasn't but i believe it was and obviously it wasn't mature by the time that crackdown 3 came out and it looks like we're getting to that point where this streaming of assets and everything is going to make games just just be outstanding going forward and will bring longevity even more longevity than i think is already there because i think these the series x 
isn't going to get like a mid-gen refresh or anything, but it'll bring even more longevity to the console. So let me know in the comments below if you guys are playing, planning on playing Flight Simulator when it drops on Game Pass and on the Xbox Series X and S. All right, finally to end off this week's show, we found out one of the mysteries on Phil Spencer's shelf. So as we know with Phil Spencer's shelf, it's been kind of a place where he's teased a lot of stuff it really started with the Xbox Series S that he hid on a shelf that nobody saw and that it was there way before they announced the Series S. And it was just something that it was pointed out after and then people kept looking at his shelf to see what else could be coming from Xbox. We've seen things like Ludens, which is linking up to a lot of the rumors that Kojima is going to be coming over to Xbox to make an exclusive Xbox ecosystem game for xCloud and how they're in the final stages of getting that deal done. And then the Nintendo Switch has been on his shelf for a while and people have always been wondering what this meant. A lot of people were thinking that this meant that Xbox Game Pass was coming over to the Nintendo Switch and obviously that hasn't happened yet. And as more time goes, the less of a chance that is going to happen. And But it looks like the case could officially be closed on Xbox Game Pass coming onto the Nintendo Switch, or at least anytime soon, as Phil Spencer finally addressed what the Nintendo Switch meant. So he was on the kind of funny GameCast, and he was asked about it, and he says this. The Switch was a gift from Nintendo. Doug Bowser and the team, they're obviously right up the hill from us. We're both in Redmond, Washington, and it was a gift from them. I have another one that I used to play at home, but that was one that they gave me early on when it launched. So that's what that's from. Now, you can take what he is saying as a complete truth to why it's there and i believe that is why it's there because when it comes to phil spencer and it comes to xbox yes he has teased stuff on his shelf before but we know xbox is very humble very open to liking everybody in the gaming industry and praising everybody in the gaming industry not taking any part in console wars so as we go through this generation i wouldn't be surprised if we see more playstation stuff more nintendo stuff more third-party stuff on his shelves and we're going to get a lot more speculation as to what all of this means because if the kojima thing comes true officially which it sounds like it's very close to becoming true but if that comes true officially with Ludens on the back of a shelf, that's just going to lead to so much more speculation of what everything else means. And I mean, I'm here for it. It makes it interesting. It makes it interesting to speculate. But could we ever see Xbox Game Pass on the Nintendo Switch? I mean, I think... I don't think so. I don't think we will ever see it because Xbox would do it in a heartbeat. I just don't think Nintendo would ever be open to it with how closed off they are with, every, with their games, with everything around Nintendo, going after people who emulate going after people who do fan remakes of their games. It's it's almost ridiculous what Nintendo does with that kind of stuff. So the chances that they would allow an app where you can download a bunch of games that that they may not have looked at or whatever, they remind me of Apple in that sense where Xbox had to circumvent Apple's rules to get Xbox Game Pass available on iOS devices through the browser. Nintendo reminds me of Apple in that sense that they would probably think similarly if with Xbox Game Pass and putting the app on there. So yeah, I don't think it's going to come. And that this kind of closes the case to Game Pass coming over to the Nintendo Switch. And then when we see something like the Steam Deck come out, Game Pass would do a lot better on the Steam Deck than it would on the Nintendo Switch because the Nintendo Switch is still is now a, is a weak device. It just that is that's it. It's a pretty weak device now. And People have been disappointed that they haven't announced the Nintendo Switch Pro. The Nintendo Switch OLED edition, in my opinion, is kind of a joke announcement upgrade. It's great if you don't have a Nintendo Switch, but if you do have a Nintendo Switch, I don't think it's worth the upgrade. I, for, for like half a millisecond, I was thinking about it. I'm like, nah, I don't need it. Especially then the Steam Deck got announced. I was like, yep, I definitely am not getting the Nintendo Switch OLED edition. But hopefully there'll be more interesting things on itself that we're going to be able to discuss in the rumors going forward and once i don't want to say once because if it doesn't but from everything we're hearing it sounds like it is going to happen but the kojima thing when if that comes true that's just going to just feel so much more speculation going forward 
throughout this generation of what does Phil Spencer's shelf mean? Anyways, guys, that's it for me this week's episode, episode number 15 of the Plumecast. Again, I can't believe we are at episode number 15 already. Again, thank you guys for watching my weekly videos, watching the podcast, listening to it, whatever you do. It really does mean a lot to help my channel grow. I'm almost at 5K subscribers now, which is which is crazy to think about. I, don't, I didn't think I would ever get there, but thank you for helping me get there and just helping me continue to grow this community and grow this channel and just have great conversations about stuff. That's the point of this channel is just to talk about what's going on, not take part in console wars and share our preference or whatever you want to say, share our passion for what Xbox is doing because they've been doing such great stuff this generation that it's hard to deny and just share a passion for video games in general, whether it is PlayStation, Nintendo, or even the Steam Deck. I can't wait to get my hands on that and eventually show it off. But thank you again for watching and I will catch you through my videos this upcoming week or in the Plumecast next Sunday.